The Sooners add more help on the offensive line through the transfer portal and more could be on the way. We'll talk about it on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners, and thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself when you purchase a Jace case, providing you with a personal supply of five antibiotics that treat 50-plus infections. Get yours today at jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. Thank you for joining us. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John Nine Williams. My buddy here is Josh Helmer. You can follow him on Twitter at Josh on Ref. And Josh, it looks like the Oklahoma Sooners are, well, they have landed some offensive line help and look like maybe they could be adding a little bit more. But first, let's talk about the transfer portal commitment the Oklahoma Sooners got over the weekend. Michael Tarkin, first of Florida, then of USC. This is somebody that Bill Bedenbo has been highly you know, he, he's been seeking him out. He's been trying to get this guy to come to Oklahoma for several years now. Now Tarkin ends up with the Sooners, played primarily at right tackle, but Oklahoma adds an experienced guy with 28 starts and quite a few snaps under his belt, playing in the SEC and the Pac-12, now coming to Norman. Blue chip kid, originally in the 2019 recruiting class. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, Bill Biedenboe and Oklahoma – They've been after Tarkin uh, when the initial transfer portal situation came around. Didn't work out. But uh, here's somebody that has started a lot of football over the course of his career. 28 starts to uh, the name. 1,100 snaps uh, via pro football focus. So somebody that has played a lot of Power 5 football, John, for Oklahoma. Uh, This has been the mode of operation here out of the transfer portal for OU in the last several seasons uh, along the offensive line. And uh, because of the circumstances, the way they played out with decisions to to go pro with uh, the Caden Green news, it again put the emphasis on Oklahoma. Maybe it was going to be there either way, but it again kind of kind of rev that up a little bit. The emphasis for Oklahoma to go find someone that has power five experience under their belt and Oklahoma's found that again in Tarkin. And now they've added three offensive linemen so far in the transfer portal and Spencer Brown, Fabichi Wiwu, and now Michael Tarkin. And, you know, two guys that can play tackle, a guy that plays guard, but it provides you, you know, a lot of experience now for an offensive line room that was going to be very inexperienced going into next season. The only guy that you had coming back with significant starts under his belt at Oklahoma was Jacob Sexton, who started the final three games of the regular season and the Alamo Bowl. And then he started in the cheese it bowl a year ago. So you get some experience back through the transfer portal and, and Oklahoma's had a lot of success adding guys out of the transfer portal, if not for you know elite players, but for really good players, whether it's, you know, a Wanye Morris or a Chris Murray or a McCade Mattire, you've had it added some really, really good players. Tyler Guyton, probably the guy with the highest ceiling, but another transfer addition for Bill Biedenboe and the Sooners, you know, offensive line room. If any of these three guys hits, that's huge for you. But if all three of them are coming, they come in and they're at least solid for you. I think that helps solidify your offensive line in a really, really big way because yeah, you, you like the group that you have. You like some of these young offensive line pieces that you have in house that you're also adding in the 2024 cycle, but you didn't necessarily want to go into that first sec season relying upon true freshmen to come in and be difference makers right away. Now, if they come in and they do that, that's fantastic. That means you're you're just kind of setting the stage for their development, but you've got some really really solid players to potentially good players uh, at, you know, in Tarkin, in Brown, in Wiwu that allow you to compete and build your depth chart and if anything else You've got veterans that you can throw out there that you know are going to do a really, really good job. Now, you with Sexton and Wee-Woo, sorry, not, not Wee-Woo, but Sexton, Brown, and Tarkin, you're kind of in an interesting dynamic here where maybe one of them might have to move to guard. And 
Obviously, Bill Beatenbow has done a really good job of moving guys around throughout his career to figure out their best spot or at least where they best fit with Oklahoma's offensive line. But that also kind of throws some interesting questions into the into the mix. Well, what about Lance Hurd, the LSU offensive tackle that is you know, heavily interested in Oklahoma, was in Norman over the weekend for a visit? If you add him, now you've got four offensive tackles with starting experience although Hurd's got fewer starts under his belt than even Jacob Sexton, but you've got a lot of talented dudes at offensive tackle. You got to have to figure something out with. By uh, my math here, you've got uh, uh, 45 plus uh, carry the eight, 73 starts that you've added out of the transfer portal in uh, obviously Tarkin in wee woo and in Brown. So Look, to me, it boils down to that more than anything with the the Tarkin news here, the, the latest domino to fall. John, they desperately, because of the transfer portal exit of, of Green, because of the just natural uh, folks get to the end of their careers, they want to turn pro, uh, feel like the eligibility, you've just about expired it. Oklahoma was losing a lot of experience, and here they've went and found 70-plus starts out of the transfer portal at tackle, at guard. So th this now gives Oklahoma some options. Let's hope, uh, uh, as you're saying, there's one final name to add. I think that would be good for Oklahoma if uh, you can add one final name out of the transfer portal and uh, bring just that little bit extra uh, ounce of competition into the equation. But where we sit right now, they brought in a ton of experience, a ton of starts to uh, to give them some versatility too. I mean, maybe this uh, makes them rethink things a little bit for Sexton. Do they bump him back inside? Does he stay outside? Do now all of a sudden you just feel like, okay, we've got a nice little uh, baseline to work with at tackle. It, either way, however Biedenboe feels about it. And remember, he, uh, John, has been very outspoken on a number of different equations. If you're playing for me, you learn every single position along the offensive line. So Bottom line, uh, if it makes them more versatile across the board, if it uh, supplements what they've got going on at the tackle positions, or if it just adds a ton of experience to the equation for OU, this uh, this was necessary for the Sooners. And give uh, OU credit. They've, they've went and recruited and got it done. Yeah, a big question mark entering the offseason has turned into, okay, you're pretty well solidified along the offensive line. If you go into next season and your offensive line looks like Jacob Sexton at left tackle, say Michael uh, Tarkin at left guard, and then some kind of position battle between Troy Everett and Joshua Bates and maybe a Eugene Brooks at center, and then right guard, Fabichi Wiwu, and then Spencer Brown at right tackle. I think you go into it feeling at least okay about it, right? It's not a maybe a Joe Moore award-winning potential offensive line, but maybe it could be. But at the very least, it's not an offensive line that's going to get Jackson Arnold killed. Because you've got a lot of experience and guys that have played a lot of football and are going to be able to hold up, you know, under the the duress of the SEC. You know, it, it's you've got to continue to build the talent and develop the talent that you have in house and develop the guys that you're bringing in through the portal. But at the very least, you're solid. You know, you, you've you've got the skill position players outside. You've got the running backs. You got the quarterback. You got a great tight end coming in in the 2024 signing class. Some really interesting pieces at tight end in the transfer portal class, your offensive line, that was kind of the biggest question and the, and the thing that was going to make or break and still could potentially make or break your 2024 season. But I think you got to feel a lot better about it right now as we sit here on January the 8th. Man, it might be a home run too if you do wind up with Herd at the end of this as well to go along with everything we've uh, talked about. I mean, you're thinking six foot six, 340 pounds. I know that he's very, very young was a true freshman this past season, but that's a former five-star that, again, you add to the equation that uh, has gone through one year of seasoning, one year of the collegiate weight training. And really, uh, you know, going forward now, John, a lot of this, we saw Oklahoma get picked off by one SEC school, and uh, it's kind of it's kind of feast or be feasted upon now in the transfer portal in the SEC, right? I mean, you probably need to win some of these type of uh, recruitments because, look, uh, in the case of Herd here, in addition to everything Oklahoma's already done, now you're talking about uh, here's somebody leaving LSU that's choosing between 
OU and Tennessee. I mean, that's SEC on SEC crime, one way you slice it, and it might as well be sliced for Oklahoma's favor. Yeah, you're going to have to win them, and sometimes you're going to have to poach some kids from some other schools as well or take advantage of some uh, roster turnover or some coaching turnover at some of these SEC programs as well. The Oklahoma Sooners had a pretty strong year in 2023, but how do people feel about them heading into 2024? We'll talk about that coming up here on Locked On Sooners. I know we come to sports to escape from some of the crazy realities of life, but can we talk just for a minute about preparing for real life? According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade. This is scary. I can't imagine a more helpless feeling than if my fiance Amanda or if uh, John, one of his kids, got sick while a supply chain issue kept them from the life-saving medication that they need. Thankfully, we'll be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case, it's a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, uh, skin infections, among others. This stuff could happen to any of us. So visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to jacemedical.com and use offer code Locked On to get $20 off your order. 2024 is now upon us. We are in the new year. But the college football season is still a little more than eight months, nine months away if you don't get to play in August. But that doesn't mean it's not too early to look at some projections, some power rankings, just to see what people think about the Oklahoma Sooners heading into next season. Uh, Josh found one from uh, our man uh, Brett over at the Action Network that had the Oklahoma Sooners over at number 13. Athlon Sports has Oklahoma at number 12. Uh, so, Josh, what do you think – do you feel like that's a, a pretty fair spot to put the Sooners um, after what we saw in 2023, where they're heading you know, this offseason, what they've lost, and what they've got coming back? Well, I'll just run down the, the top 25 way too early. Of course, it's way too early season for everybody across college football. But this, of course, as you mentioned from Brett McMurphy of the Action Network, Georgia 1, Michigan 2, Oregon 3 – Alabama 4, Ohio State 5, Texas 6, Notre Dame 7, Arizona 8, Ole Miss 9. At number 10 is Missouri, number 11, Penn State, number 12, Kansas State, and number 13, Oklahoma. Just rounding out the top 15 here for us. Number 14 is LSU, and number 15 is Oklahoma State. I think it's reasonable after what we saw in the, the bowl game, John. I think that Oklahoma's clearly – Got uh, plenty of talent, right, at uh, the skill positions that they've got coming back. You've got uh, a five-star in Jackson Arnold that looked like a five-star at times and obviously made a number of uh, critical mistakes in the game versus Arizona as well. So to me, uh, with the defensive decisions returning, you think about uh, the star power that Oklahoma returns there. It, to, it would be hard to not have Oklahoma, I think, within the nation's top 15 teams, but uh, – I think it's reasonable to not yet have Oklahoma inside the top 10 teams. Yeah, that's fair to me. I feel like if you're looking at the top 15 and, and who's just in front of Oklahoma, I mean, I could make a case to have Oklahoma ahead of Missouri, uh, ahead of Kansas State. And then, I mean, Penn State, I mean, that's a good program, but it's just an up and down program too. You, you just, you look at it and you're like, okay, you can't get past Michigan State or you can't, sorry, you can't get past Michigan, can't get past Ohio State. In some years, you can't get past Michigan State. Uh, so, you know, yeah, that's going to be a really, really good defense coming back for the Nittany Lions. But, I mean, Missouri, okay, it had a really, really good year. They beat Ohio State in the Cotton Bowl. I mean, Ohio State, quote, unquote, uh, in the Cotton Bowl. But I'm just not bought in yet. I'm going to need to see another year from them to really feel like, okay, Missouri is going to be a player because – before 2023, they had never won more than six games under Eli Drinkwitz. Now, they're becoming a big-time player in the NIL game, and that's giving them an opportunity to take that step into the top of the SEC and into the top 15, top 10. But I'm just not sold just yet. 
they're gonna have to do it another year. Now they lose their defensive coordinator. And to me, that's that that was a big part of their success is finding a way on defense to to help their offense out. They had some really, really good offensive games, but it was the defense making the jump that they made that kept Missouri rising in the rankings, similar to Oklahoma. You know, the offense was still good, but it was the defensive improvements that saw Oklahoma rise in the rankings. Oklahoma, yeah, you lost Ted Roof as your defensive coordinator, but you kept Brent Venables, the mastermind of this defense, and potentially improved your recruiting and your linebacker recruiting with the addition of Zach Alley as a defensive coordinator for the Oklahoma Sooners. Uh, Kansas State, I mean, I, I just don't know. Like, yes, I believe Avery Johnson is coming back at quarterback, but will they be the same team? Will they continue to improve? Uh, I believe they lose Phillip Brooks. They lose some other uh, Im impressive pieces off that roster. Again, a really, really well-coached team, but kind of disappointed in 2023. So will they be better than they were this past year? I don't know that. Uh, but I think you could make a case for Oklahoma being a little bit higher. You could also make a case for Oklahoma being a little bit lower, given that you still have maybe some questions as to how the offensive line is going to come together, where the pass rush is going to come from, joining the SEC and the tough slate that they have. I could understand people saying, okay, maybe Oklahoma will not end up as a top 15 team at the end of the season, but I can understand being in the top 15 going into the season for sure. The uh, other SEC team that's ranked uh, according to Brett McMurphy in his way too early poll is Tennessee at number uh, 17. So by my count, eight SEC teams ranked, including Oklahoma, and uh, OU plays six of the seven that uh, aren't named Oklahoma. The, the one that they don't play, of course, uh, is Georgia. And who knows, right? Uh, things go according to plan. Maybe you will play Georgia in the 2024 college football season. But that gives you an indication of the perceived schedule strength uh, or difficulty for Oklahoma going into next season. I mean, that's that's kind of wild to think that uh, half of your schedule, according to this way too early uh, poll, the, you got ranked opponents on it. Yeah, the ESPN football power index is going to love Oklahoma next year because of the strength of their opponents. That schedule is going to be daunting. I was looking at it again today as I was doing my 2024, you know, rankings of each of Oklahoma's opponent over at Sooners Wire. And man, it, it's just tough. It's going to be tough sledding week in and week out, whether it's the the opponent you're facing or the location in which you're facing that opponent. I mean, it's there's no easy task. I mean, Missouri is a better team but you also have to go on the road and face Missouri Auburn. Okay. Who knows how good they're going to be. They've been kind of average the last few years, but you have to go on the road to face Auburn Ole Miss. They might just be a national title contender next year. And you have to go to Oxford. Uh, you still, yeah, you get Alabama at home, you get Tennessee at home, but Tennessee, they've been really good. And yeah, they lost Joe Milton, but they've got their own five-star quarterback. That's going to be taking the reins. And Nico, I am a late, I am Leva uh, at quarterback. And the dude is really, really good. And that defensive has improved uh, for the volunteers. So there's not going to be an easy week. And that's not even to mention Texas. That That is always a coin flip game no matter what. Um, it's tough. It's tough sledding. Your non-conference slate is pretty pretty uh, manageable. Uh, and then obviously that South Carolina game is should be in your favor. But you got to go win the game. No, that's but, right. Yeah. But yeah, it's it. it I think it shows the respect that Brent Venables has earned uh, in just a short time as a head coach, but also kind of bleeding over from his time as a defensive coordinator to, to stay kind of in that top 15, even though they've lost some key parts, you know, going into the off season. Yeah. And hopefully Latrell and Allie respectively can get this thing humming for Oklahoma on both sides of the football. Allie definitely has uh, the best collection of talent he's had uh, to work with in his career and got some, Big time return decisions that uh, should make him very happy entering uh, next season. All right, Monday night, it's the big one the college football playoff national championship game. We got the Michigan Wolverines and the Washington Huskies. We'll talk about it coming up next here on Locked On Sooners. Today's episode brought to us by FanDuel Sportsbook. Well, the NFL regular season 
it's over, but there's still time to get in on the action with playoff action. That's at FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app, it's super easy to use, and there's so many different ways to bet, like Live same game parlays. You can find bets uh, in the new explore tab that makes it easy for newcomers. Make a parlay in the parlay hub. It's the best way to find popular parlays and so much more. So visit fanduel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. Fanduel, an official partner of the NFL. National championship time. Let's talk about it. I know we're not locked on Wolverines or locked on Huskies, but it's the big game. It's the last college football game of the year until we get to August. So, Josh, what's your initial thoughts on this game? Because you've got Michael Penix on one side, arguably the best quarterback in the nation, although Jalen Daniels won the Heisman. Michael Penix had a strong case to win it as well, helped navigate the Huskies to an undefeated season in which they won a lot of close games. A lot of that due to Michael Penick's magic late in games. But what's your take? You know, we've got Michigan also really, really good defensively, good run game. JJ McCarthy is just kind of that that quarterback that just can do it all and, and just wins games for you. Can they rebound from you know what was a, a really emotional win over Alabama and come back and and, and be locked in from the get-go against Washington? Well, this is the final stop, right? In the uh, we showed you tour. Uh, you, you think that we need uh, a bunch of technology to win football games tour. And I do think that Michigan is the more talented team top to bottom recruiting rankings over the last however many years would bear that out. But those rankings aside, I think top to bottom, they're a little bit more complete offensively and defensively. Uh, but I'm going to stick with Washington to win the football game. I just think Michael Penix Jr., uh, Roma Dunze, I just think that offensively the difference with the quarterback and Penix Jr. versus J.J. McCarthy, after what I saw from Washington versus Texas, he was making uh, NFL plays out there left and right. And uh, obviously he's going to face a better top-to-bottom defense in Michigan than uh, he saw in Texas. But I just, I'm going to ride with the quarterback in this one. I guess it kind of bucks the historical college football playoff trend. Typically a team like Michigan would be more likely to win this national championship. I just think Washington has something special. This is their chance. And I think Michael Penix Jr. is going to guide them to the natty. That's kind of how I feel about it as well. You know, it's hard to look at what Michael Penix was able to do under pressure uh, last week against Texas and then automatically think, okay, well, Michigan's defensive front is really, really good. I'll, that's going to get to Michael Penix. No, the dude's got really, really good pocket awareness. He's able to you know, climb the pocket to evade pressure and still make plays down the football field. And yeah, that wide receiver core, man, is really, really, really good. You might be able to slow him down a little bit, but they're going to make big plays on you. They just do. And, and I think that's what Texas found out last week is you can slow them down for a little bit. You might be able to stall them for a drive or two, but eventually they're going to hit you for a big, big play. And I think Washington's defense is a competitive one. I feel like they've got a little bit of a chip on their shoulder coming into this thinking, okay, everybody thinks that Texas's defense is better and Michigan's defense is better. We're going to go out and we're going to prove that we're just as good and we can make enough winning plays to win football games. That's what they've done all year, right? They may not have been elite or have elite numbers, but they've made winning football plays every single week. And that's why they're undefeated. And, and yeah, Michigan is really, really good. They're really well coached as well. And I mean, JJ McCarthy and Blake Corum and, and that defensive front is going to provide, you know, a, an opportunity for Michigan to win this game. And they've also got a great offensive line in their own right. How well Washington's able to stop the run is going to be a critical component to this game, because if Michigan can just lean heavily on their offensive line and the run game, it's going to slow things down and it's going to play into the Wolverines favor. But again, Washington's got the skill talent to be able to make this a bit of a track meet when they have the football. So I think it's going to be a really, really close game. I do think that Washington wins it and they win it in a close one, maybe by three or four points, something like that, where it's a last minute touchdown that that kind of seals the game or they're able to make a stop to, to prevent Michigan from coming back and winning the game. 
that's just kind of how I feel about it. But if this gets into a high scoring affair, give me the Huskies. Definitely. Uh, I just don't, I, I think JJ McCarthy's good. I just don't know if he's going to have the skill talent to be able to, to play a 40 point game. If Jim Harbaugh is able to keep this down in the twenties and thirties, then I think it favors Michigan a little bit. But again, give me the Huskies. I think it's going to be a really, really great game. Just another great game in a long line of great games that we've gotten this college football season, whether it's the the regular season or the you know championship weekend or the bowls or college football playoff. It's just, it's been fantastic. It might be one of the best seasons from a parody perspective that we've had in a really, really long time. And I, and I think that gives a lot of people an and me included, excitement for what we're going to get in 2024 when the playoff expands to 12. Yeah, no, it should. It's it's going to be fun when we we get there, and it'll, uh, at times, I think, house a surprise or two just by the nature of there being more games that are going to get played. Uh, it might house a laugher more or two as well because, again, <laughs> the number of games that are getting played, and uh, you're bringing a non power opponent into the equation as we saw in this bowl season uh, wasn't a recipe for uh, a couple of close games so that uh, that possibility will be there too but I think you touched on the two biggest things in this game of this national championship which is if Washington slows down quorum enough I think uh, that probably lends them to have some success uh, they're not a great pass defense they're 120th in passing yards allowed but I think they're up against a quarterback in J.J. McCarthy that maybe that's kind of where you want to live, right? You want to make McCarthy have to try to beat you in the throw game. So if they can do that, I like their chances. And then the other component will be, okay, how well does the offensive line hold up? And how well does Michael Penix Jr. handle it when they don't hold up, right? Is he going to be able to make some off-schedule throws and plays? And if the answer is yes, which it was versus Texas, then again, I think Washington's going to win the national championship. I just think there's something about this kid that uh, he's just on a magical run. But we'll see. Should be a great game. It's going to be a great game. I can't wait, and we'll break it down at some point on Locked On Sooners, given that we don't have more pressing Oklahoma news uh, to get to as the week goes along. But that's going to do it for today's episode. Thanks so much for tuning in and being a part of the show. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. We're free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube. Hit that notification bell to let you know when new episodes drop. Follow Josh on Twitter at Josh on Ref, myself at John Nine Williams. The show is at Locked On Sooners. But until next time, he's Josh Helmer. I'm John Williams, Boomer sooner.